like to talk about uh, evolving expectations in open source. Uh, basically, the, the way that the way that we are we do things and the way that we're expected to do things by the community is evolving over time. And I wanted to spend a few minutes today talking about that. In the uh, before times, uh, open source project teams really just wrote code. Uh, we had uh, back in the day. Uh, CVS uh, server for for code management. We had a Bugzilla uh, instance for tracking issues. We had mailing lists, uh, and we had a means of providing downloads. And that really was uh, the forge, and that was the, you know the services that the the Eclipse Foundation provided. Uh, we needed a few other things uh, as well. Um, but we may not have all thought too hard about this. Foundations took care of things like uh, license management. Uh, we did a lot of provenance checking of content uh, just to make sure that uh, content was, uh, we were able to litigate or uh, mitigate against uh, legal, potential legal issues in, in content. Uh, and uh, we provided a, a framework for, for doing legal documentation to ensure that the people contributing code um, and content were um, able to do so under under the terms of the project license and whatnot. Um, the Eclipse Foundation has always had a, a really rigorous intellectual property policy and due diligence process uh, that does require some pretty heavy investment from from the committers. Uh, and of course, open source is nothing without community. Uh, in the early days, community engagement was almost entirely uh, at a grassroots uh, level with developers connecting with developers. To a very large extent, the uh, early success of the Eclipse IDE was due to developers reaching out and communicating directly with other developers. Uh, it's one thing to attend hackathons, uh, user groups, conferences, and other similar sorts of activities to get the word out. But these events need to be organized, uh, coordinated, and run. Uh, even when an event is casual, it requires investment. This is another way that uh, foundations uh, came along and, and helped. Uh, whatever the case, we want people to know about our open source projects. Uh, we want people to use our open source project, and we want to give uh, want them to give back by participating of themselves in the continued development of, of open source projects. Uh, but mostly, uh, software developers just want to write code. Expectations. Uh, have changed, however. Uh, we still do all of the stuff that I mentioned earlier. Um, well, some of it uh, has changed, at least at the Eclipse Foundation, CVS uh, gave way to SVN, SVN gave way to Git. Uh, the effort to, to move to Git, uh, incidentally, uh, was a, a multi-year effort. Uh, and in some cases, we dragged all of our uh, project teams uh, to get uh, kicking and uh, screaming. Uh, except one, uh, uh, you may be uh, amused to know that the Eclipse Subversive project uh, is still running on SVN, uh, requiring uh, that they move uh, to Git felt a little mean. Um, as an aside, you might be thinking to yourself, uh, wait, uh, Eclipse Subversive uh, is still a thing? Uh, the project team has relatively recently been replaced and they are moving. Um, Expectations have changed from uh, the community. Our communities expect a lot out of a, an open source project. Um, open source developers now get uh, an awful lot of questions that are not just about code uh, or adoption. Um, I'm gonna try and provide some answers to some of these questions as we move through, through the presentation today. Uh, badges have become a thing. Uh, it's common today to see readmes with uh, sometimes dozens of badges showing status for license compliance, uh, build status, license compliance. Uh, oh, sorry, uh, list of licenses. I said license compliance twice because uh, apparently that's exciting to me. Uh, best practices, test coverage, and more. Um, some project teams really embrace this. Uh, see Again, sometimes you see dozens of these badges uh, on, on project pages. Uh, so clearly these are things that, that some project teams are valuing or, and, or, at least, or at least believe that their communities and their adopters perceive them as valuable. There's a lot of stuff to embrace. Uh, this is a uh, collection of logos of the various foundations and projects that are doing things in open source. And there's various levels of expectation through the community that we participate uh, in some, many, all uh, of these. The Eclipse Foundation has been working with the SPDX and clearly defined uh, folks for a while. Uh, and the Eclipse Foundation is a CVE numbering authority. 
we've recently certified as being open chain compliant, and uh, we're looking at uh, rolling out uh, the OSS review toolkit, ORT, uh, to overhaul our IP due diligence process. Uh, several of our projects uh, use uh, are reuse compliant. Uh, I'll talk a, a little bit about each of these um, as we move forward. There are so many uh, other initiatives underway, and the Eclipse Foundation is trying to engage with as many of them as we can on behalf of our projects. Where possible, we're identifying opportunities to build up services to support our open source project team so that they can focus on uh, what they do best, write, write code. The uh, prevailing trend uh, is to um, have the support content be more tightly coupled with code. Uh, in the, the days of having a how to contribute and how to build or even documentation, uh, how to uh, how to use documentation uh, on a on a separate website is either behind us or very quickly uh, falling behind us. Uh, the expectation is that this sort of information is contained coupled directly with uh, the project code uh, contained directly in the, the project's uh, source code repository. Uh, GitLab and GitHub make rendering support documentation uh, very first class. Um, so it's effectively a website anyway. Um, GitLab and GitHub have built in support for things like uh, accessing a security policy or a code of conduct, uh, which again makes it super easy. Um, and again, that tight coupling really works. The fact that uh, open source Git repositories uh, can be and are forked or, and moved around um, mean, makes it ever, ever more important that this information be coupled fairly tightly. Um, sort of keeping all this information together in one place makes it easier for developers uh, to find out what they need and to find out, uh, find their way back to the original uh, repository and original project team. Uh, I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about intellectual property management and, and our evolution uh, here. Um, I won't talk too much about the past and kind of focus more on a move forward. Um, one of the things uh, that's important is we've recently self-certified as an open chain um, compliant, uh, which basically means that our intellectual property management processes uh, are well-defined. Uh, we have uh, training policies and processes in place to um, provide support for uh, all of the various actors involved. Um, so open chain is, uh, is, is, is interesting. It's a, again, it's about standardizing, um, having standardizing uh, having processes this doesn't really describe a process for doing it it's more that you have to have a process and um, the eclipse foundation has actually been doing uh, all of the things um, for for quite some time uh, we didn't actually have to do very much to to become compliant we, we really just had to com claim compliance um, we've been using uh, spdx uh, license identifiers for a while. Eclipse committers uh, have been including them in file headers, and in and the IP team has been using them to talk about licenses uh, for for years now. Um, our current policy is that all source content uh, that can have a file header must have a file header. Uh, obvious exceptions are made for file formats like JSON uh, that doesn't support comments. Cases um, where adding he headers to a generated code is challenging or, or it is otherwise onerous to do so. Um, the example I'm showing here is, uh, you know, has some some textual description of the uh, of the license, uh, and it also has uh, an SPDX license identifier, and that's kind of the the interesting SPDX part that, that we're doing so far. Um, you'll notice SPDX, um, the, the language of that. You, you think about it in terms of the consumer. So an or means that a consumer can consume this content under you know, in one license or the other, uh, and you can chain them together. There's also ands and, and there's, a, there's a whole expression uh, language uh, around this in terms of how to very uh, precisely describe the license of content. Um, I haven't seen this widespread yet, uh, but there, we may soon start to see an evolution in the standards around uh, copyright headers. Uh, human readable text is imprecise and difficult to parse. Uh, SPDX as a means of very precisely describing uh, more than just license terms. We can also use SPDX uh, fields to specify copyrights and, and, and so much more. Again, um, I don't think that our standard 
file headers are changing anytime soon, but this sort of compact header has some potential to be useful. Um, so again, the example I'm showing here is, you know, potentially an exact, the exact header, the entire the entire contents of a potential header at some point in the future. Again, I'm seeing this here and there, but uh, not, not something, we're just something we're watching at this point. Um, SPDX also defines a standard for specifying a software bill of materials, uh, referred to as an SBOM. Uh, that is uh, effectively a means of capturing license and copyright information about content included uh, in a software distribution. SBOMs that identify and provide important uh, metadata about the content that is included and consumed are an important part of supply chain management. Uh, they be, they, they're becoming increasingly valued and uh, are quickly becoming an expected artifact by consumers and uh, open source uh, code and products. Uh, SPDX SBOMs are uh, machine readable and, uh, well, at least nominally uh, human readable. Uh, a few different formats are supported, uh, including the tag value format that I'm showing here. Uh, the tag value format is actually the most human readable of the of the forms, in, in my opinion. Uh, there's XML based and other other formats. Um, strictly speaking, our IP logs are a form of a bill of materials, except that they're they're not publicly accessible and they do have some gaps. Uh, they're actually a pretty poor uh, implementation of an SBOM. Um, our best equivalent is actually uh, the about HTML files that uh, you find in Eclipse Platform plugins or the notice file uh, that uh, that we we uh, look for when we're doing our uh, reviews, uh, which is in the root of the repository. Again, keeping the support artifacts tightly coupled with the project content. Um, the Eclipse Dash license tool, which I'll talk about in a minute, can generate a bill of materials in the form of a CSV uh, list of third-party dependencies along with their license information. Um, at this point, we're investigating the adoption of S, uh, S bombs, SPDX S bombs um, for all Eclipse projects, and, and specifically, we're looking at uh, what tools and resources the Eclipse Foundation can bring to bear to help project teams generate and uh, maintain them. Um, all of the tools that we currently use to scan software, um, uh, determine license and other metadata, uh, as part of being good citizens, we've, uh, and to meet what appears to be growing expectations from adopters, uh, we've started working with the folks uh, from the reuse uh, project. The intention of reuse um, is to provide uh, complete information about the copyrights and licenses uh, of all of the material and software uh, in a software repository. Um, reuse is specifically concerned with the source code. Uh, when they say complete information, they really mean complete. Uh, to be reuse compliant, uh, the copyright and license of every single file in a repository must be expressed. Copyright and license can be expressed in headers um, using SPDX information, or in the case where expressing that information is uh, in a, directly in a file is, is difficult or impossible, uh, there's this notion of a DEP5 uh, file. Reuse uh, compliance is not required, uh, but it is recommended. Uh, like I said, adopters are coming to expect it and providing it uh, certainly takes a lot of the guesswork out of the intellectual property due diligence process. Uh, that is, uh, our IP team uh, loves it when they find this kind of information in third party content uh, that they're asked to review. Um, Eclipse Dirigible, Eclipse Steady, and Eclipse Dash uh, all have reuse compliant repositories. Reuse uses uh, Debian's uh, DEP5 uh, files to capture uh, license information on those files that do not have license uh, headers of their own. Uh, here's a snippet of uh, a DEP5 file from uh, the Eclipse Dash license tool. Uh, you can see here that I'm declaring the license for the Eclipse IDE's project uh, file, dot .project file. So again, it's that level that there's a file in the repository. It has to have license information. Uh, there's a yarn lock file, uh, which uh, was provided by uh, Jonah Graham that I didn't want to perturb with uh, by adding a license. And um, another example of a, there's a JSON file uh, that contains some test data. Uh, like I said in the previous slide, uh, making your project reuse compliant is something that helps you describe more completely the nature of the copyrights and licenses uh, of all of the content contained in your project. Uh, it's not currently a requirement uh, for Eclipse projects to be reuse uh, compliant, but it is becoming more and more expected uh, by consumers. The Dash license tool. Um, We've been experimenting, and this experiment has been pretty successful uh, with uh, some new tools to do third-party uh, due diligence. Uh, and you may have heard rumblings of this, and certainly a lot of committers have been engaged. Uh, we've been keeping it relatively low-key to kind of try and uh, roll it out 
uh, in, a, in a measured and, and controlled way. Uh, but the idea is uh, you know, we take a dependency list, um, ideally generated from your build, feed it to uh, the tool, uh, which then consults with different um, sources of information clearly defined or, or IPZilla. Uh, and then based on that generates a, a list of that content mapped to licenses. Uh, in the case where license information cannot be determined uh, for content, uh, we then engage with the IP team to, uh, to, com to, to fill in that information and update the, our, our databases, our sources of information, uh, with with uh, with the new new content, and um, and then that feeds back into the tool. So the the intention is that over time, the tools, uh, the data that backs the tool becomes more and more complete, and the tool uh, winds up uh, you know identifying relatively little uh, that needs uh, further review. I'm going to talk a bit more about this as I move forward. Um, so the Eclipse Dash license tool is an interim solution to start to reduce the process uh, of, of the intellectual property management burden. Uh, we want to reduce the burden for, for Eclipse committers uh, by automating as much of it as possible. Um, I'll point out that the tool is only as good as the input it's given. Uh, it doesn't know how to dig in. It only knows what you tell it. Um, we're looking at tools actually that dig in. Um, here I'm showing a Maven plugin, uh, the, the Maven plugin that we have uh, being used to, uh, are being invoked on a project's repository. The plugin uh, uses the information that Maven itself gathers regarding the dependencies as a starting point. It attempts to find vetted information uh, for each dependency. So uh, as long as Maven knows about the dependency, the tool does a, a really good job. Uh, I've noticed that we sometimes have to do a little digging with Eclipse Tyco uh, based builds. Um, be looking for some help. I've been looking for some help for, with that for, for a while and we've had some success. Um, there's also a command line version of the tool that knows how to deal with package lock and yarn lock files, as well as files that contain lists of arbitrary content. It's possible, uh, for example, to pipe the output from Gradle into a grep and get a list of dependencies, then pipe that directly into the tool. The uh, Git repositories readme has numerous examples of different technologies and how we engage the tool using it. <clears throat> a little word about clearly uh, defined IDs. Um, we um, use clearly defined IDs. Um, there are many different technologies that have uh, different ways of identity, identifying content. Uh, many, perhaps most, uh, Eclipse projects use Maven or Gradle in some manner. Maven uniquely identifies contents uh, using a, a GAV or a group ID uh, version uh, uh, um, couple. Uh, in fact, uh, content is uh, further defined by its source. Uh, so at least potentially content in one Maven repository, say Maven Central, could uh, have the same GAV, but be different content than, than in another Maven repository, say at repo.eclipse.org. Um, Golang generally, but not exclusively, uses a combination of GitHub uh, repository location and version. NPMJS uses a variation of uh, what looks like Perl, uh, P-U-R-L, pardon me, uh, to identify content in its repository. Content in NPMJS may be different from content in Yarn package. Uh, clearly defined IDs com uh, combine the type and the source of the information uh, with the specific coordinates. Uh, to be sure, it has some deficiencies. Uh, for example, Maven classifiers are not cons uh, considered, but uh, it's a pretty good way of uniquely identifying uh, specific content. Um, here's an example of um, the command line version of the tool being used uh, on a yarn lock file. Uh, in this case, the tool has identified some content for which it cannot uh, find vetted license information. The, um, I've added a review switch, uh, have specif uh, specified that an, uh, that specified a, also specifies an access token and a, and a project ID. Um, you need to get the access token from the Eclipse Foundation's GitLab instance to use this feature. Uh, don't share uh, your access token. This feature automatically creates review requests that are automatically scanned uh, by the server. In the event that vetted license information cannot be identified, the IP team will engage. This feature depends on various conventions to identify locations of source archives, so you don't have to figure that out yourself generally. Um, it currently supports content retrieved from Maven and NPMJS and there is ongoing work to support Golang repository, uh, Yarn package, and more. Uh, at this point, uh, I, however, I should iterate that the Eclipse Dash license tool is intended as an interim solution while we plot a, a more extensive reworking of the Eclipse Foundation's IP due diligence process. Uh, we're still in the early stages of investigating the implementation of ORT, 
uh, for Eclipse Foundation projects, but uh, what we've learned so far is very promising. The OSS Review Toolkit, or ORT, uh, brings a bunch of tools together to provide what appears to be a very complete solution. Um, uh, our IP team uh, uses a scan code uh, toolkit, uh, for example, uh, already to automate scans for third-party content uh, that's used by uh, ORT. Uh, there's other other features. Uh, again, we're using a lot of the, this technology already, and this kind of puts it all together into a nice coherent package. Uh, what we're hoping to achieve is a process where ORT just scans all of our repositories, identifies the use of third-party content, reviews that third-party content, along with the licensing information captured uh, in project content, and then engages the IP team to resolve what needs further scrutiny. Um, ideally, we'll get to a point where the IP team will occasionally just have to tap committers on the shoulder to ask for a bit of assistance in relatively rare cases when help is needed. That's the dream. Um, it's looking promising. Um, so our plan is, uh, you know, basically we've been using uh, IPzilla a uh, fairly cumbersome process since 2006. Uh, we've been using a Dash license tool for a year, we'll probably use it for, for a little you know, little while longer. Uh, again, we're still just plotting though the next stage, which is hopefully in 2022, we'll have uh, ORT running at least on some subset of the projects and eventually, you know, eventually committers don't have to think too hard about intellectual property um, management and you know, we'll, we'll, we'll do most of the heavy lifting automatically. Again, just to manage expectations, that's the dream. Um, some play, some ways that you can get, in, get involved. Uh, we have uh, some, I'll, I'll, I'll post this so you can get these links. Uh, basically just some of the different efforts. Uh, of course, we track everything through issues um, and uh, try, to, uh, try to be as public and open as we possibly can while we're doing all of this. Um, we do a lot of work with security and vulnerability management as well. Um, one of the things that we're asking now is that project teams start creating a security policy. We're asking, we're not telling. Uh, this is something uh, we think is is valuable. Uh, we do have default security policies in place on GitHub where, you know, for example, where, where, where that such a thing is supported. Um, generally, security policy should say, you know, what versions do you do? You, you, will you do support and, and how does somebody actually report a vulnerability? Uh, re re uh, vulnerability reporting re requires confidentiality. Uh, issues are, are a form of disclosure, and at least in many cases, we need to be careful um, about disclosing vulnerabilities too soon. For that, we need confidentiality, and we're not particularly good um, at confidential. Uh, GitLab and Bugzilla do have means of making issues uh, uh, confidential. GitHub does not. Uh, GitHub does have a whole security advisories infrastructure that allows committers to work confidentially on a solution, but it does not provide a confidential channel for actually reporting a vulnerability. Um, even confidential channels need to conform to the Eclipse Foundation development process's uh, open source rules of engagement. Effectively, this means that the playing field needs to be level, at least for committers. So there's lots of uh, uh, there has to be a means for committers to have access to the confidential reports. This doesn't leave a lot of options for projects that aren't using GitLab or GitHub. We're exploring options. Uh, the best option I can think of at the time is to provide uh, our open source projects with a private mailing list, uh, but no archive uh, configured to allow anybody to send email, uh, but only sends to committers. Uh, the security at eclipse.org uh, email uh, mailing list is set up like this now. Uh, unfortunately, it is the target of a huge amount of spam. Um, I do, however, respect the audacity of those individuals who send phishing emails to a security alias. Um, anyway, um, all confidential issues and related discussion does have to be disclosed eventually. Our default is to disclose all vulnerabilities after a maximum of three months, whether a patch is uh, available or not. Uh, the Eclipse Foundation is a CVE numbering authority. That means that we have the ability to assign numbers uh, to vulnerabilities and deliver them to the central authority where they are made available to the entire world. Uh, organizations like NIST, uh, which who are concerned with vulnerability tracking, use uh, these repositories to detect uh, their use of software with known vulnerabilities and uh, allow them to plan a mitigation strategy. Uh, Dependabot on GitHub uh, uses this information. Creating a first CV is a bit of a rite of passage uh, for an open source project. It is, uh, frankly, uh, a good thing for a project to have a CVE or two. Uh, that vulnerabilities have been detected is a sign that the software is actually being used and is on the radar of security researchers. Um, again, um, it's a good thing. Uh, uh, not having uh, a CVE or two on your project is actually regarded by some as a red flag. Um, you know, 
if 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 you have a, a CVE, then your your content has been used in anger. Um, the Eclipse Project Handbook describes how to create a CVE. Basically, I need you to describe uh, the product uh, that's affected, uh, its affected range and affected versions, uh, a description of the problem, a common weakness uh, enumeration or a CWE. CWEs are used to categorize uh, vulnerabilities. Uh, CD, CWE 400, for example, is used to categorize uh, uncontrolled resource consumption. Um, where possible, we also calculate a CVSS, which is a number that qualifies the severity of the vulnerability. Uh, the short version is send a note to security at eclipse.org and, and we'll help you out. Um, so again, we're, we're a CVE numbering authority. Over the years, the number of CVEs that we've been creating has been increasing. Uh, we're on track to exceed all expectations uh, this year. Um, just quick shout out to Eclipse Steady is one of the consumers of some of this uh, data. They, they actually consume it indirectly through a service called OWASP. Uh, but uh, Steady analyzes Java and Python applications for, uh, for, for vulnerabilities. Uh, incidentally, the um, ORT stack that we're talking about or implementing also has a, a integration for, for discovering vulner, uh, vulnerable package use. Um, we also have some issues open uh, regarding vulnerabilities tracking and, and our evolution of, of how, how we're doing security policies and whatnot. Um, I'm going to wrap up quickly just with a super quick overview of some of the foundations that, uh, that we're either engaged with or think that we need to be engaged with. Um, Continuous Delivery Foundation. Uh, the Chaos uh, Group is um, interested in health and analytics. The uh, software heritage uh, basically preserve all source code in all in, in all versions. They're pretty ambitious, uh, ambitious effort. We, uh, you know, the, the to do group is out there um, collaborating uh, more to you know business level of their, how to create open source uh, program offices. Uh, Ospo Zone is another another one of another uh, a similar attempt. Um, or similar work to to build uh, and build and support uh, open source program offices, and uh, you know, again we're we're pretty heavily involved in in the OSPO zone, and uh, there's uh, there's a lot of good stuff there for organizations that are setting up open source uh, offices. And uh, with that, um, I'm going to stop. Uh, if you ever wondered what the EMO does, this is what we do. Thank you. I hope that was useful. Um, sorry, I kind of sped up at the end there because, of course, I always uh, I always run over. Um, got a couple of questions. Is there a recommendation, uh, a standard, or a best practice on how to do S bombs or how they should look like? Um, as I stated, uh, or tried to perhaps I did a poor job of it. Um, today we have a requirement for notices file. This is documented in the handbook. Um, we do provide some tools to help generate that that are not great um uh, they, they there there's certainly some gaps in it um projects doing uh eclipse platform plugins uh they they have a, you know the about files wind up being in composite wind up being the the software bill of materials um but uh, where we are moving to is uh, probably to as i suggested spdx s bombs uh, that's uh, that seems to be an accepted industry standard and uh, something that we believe um, provides all of the answers to the questions uh, that we have about it. Um, the next question, uh, would you ever teach a course or a class on how to ensure someone is reuse compliant? Um, probably not, because frankly, the reuse.software uh, team does a really good job of this. Um, so I, I would point you over to, again, it's reuse.software is the, uh, the, the, the URL uh, for the website there. Uh, and like I went through it and like literally it was, you know, a few minutes worth of my time. They have some presentations there, some videos, um, a lot of how to's. Uh, it's uh, they, they do a fantastic job of it. So we, we just lever leverage their good work. Um, the last question I have on my list is how should the generated IP log be extended with the dependencies files created by the Dash tool? Um, great question. What we have been doing uh, in order to continue to satisfy the uh, requirements of the IP process is that we have been attaching uh, a generated dependencies file uh, to uh, the same issue that we use to track the, the IP log, uh, again, more of an interim solution. Uh, some project teams have been, and we're going to start more strongly encouraging this, um, in, including the generated dependencies file in their repository. Uh, and uh, we, you know, I, I, I believe, is 
strongly believe that this uh, satisfies the uh, the tracking requirement um, uh, that's outlined in the Eclipse Foundation's IP policy. Um, those are uh, the, the questions. If you have more questions about this, uh, please do send me an email. EMO at Eclipse.org uh, is the easiest way to get hold of me. And um, uh, of course, the Dash license tool is uh, on GitHub. Um, I'll, links are all in the presentation, which I will post. Um, thank you for your attention. I hope something is useful here. Uh, the Eclipse Foundation is uh, doing its best to try and help open source projects uh, be successful and let you focus on writing code. I hope you enjoyed the conference. Enjoy the closing session. Um, thanks. <laughs>